Hi, my name is Keith Cooper from North Flight Images and in this video I'm going to have a look at two photography books which have had a massive influence over the years in many aspects of my photography. Many more aspects than I would originally have thought just by looking at what the books were about. Now, they are technical books. Uh, they're available online. Um, if you do download them, see the bit about making and find them useful, see the bit about making a contribution to the author in it. Uh, the guy who wrote them is Harold Merklinger and the two books are Focusing the View Camera. Now this is a view camera but you could also say so are these cameras here with tilt shift lenses and that's what it applies to. And the second one which I'll come back to is the ins and outs of focus. Now this one is about depth of field, how to understand that, how to understand sharpness and all kinds of things. Now they were written a while ago which means they look at film effectively but they are perfectly applicable today. I'll come back to this one because this is the one that led me to basically ditch any ideas of using hyperfocal uh, focusing and led me to have complete disdain for any of these depth of field scales that you get on lenses. This is a 90 millimeter tilt shift by the way and um, I'll come back to some of the lenses I used and why. But the first one the view camera. Now this is a view camera as I said this is an MPP. It's an old 5 before film or 4 by 5 I believe in the US but 5 before over here. The film goes at the back here. Big film. It's got a 150mm lens. It's got lots of movements in it and you can see here that the front, or the front standard which has got the lens on it and the shutter and the aperture is tilted downwards. You know, this thing on the front here is a lens hood or compendium as it's known for on these and that's extensible as well. But literally you take your, this when you're using it, you focus it off the view screen at the back here. There's a frosted glass. Um, I originally adapted this for use uh, and I put a link to the article that I did a while ago uh, about making a camera adapter to replace this film holder at the back here so I could try this with a digital camera. Of course the problem is the camera I used was a Canon 1DS Mark III with a 24 by 35 mil full frame 36 mil uh, full frame sensor which is much smaller than 5 by 4 on the back here. Uh, even this Fuji GFX with a small medium format sensor at 33 by 44 millimeter is still way smaller than here. Because one of the things that means with this big uh, screen at the back here and the big film size is that you use longer focal lengths because you get a wider field of view with the larger film. So this has got a 150 mil rod and stock lens on it with a shutter and everything. Here's the shutter release for it. Now What's the important bit about focusing it that makes these things so difficult? You'd think all you do is, well, all right, it's a bit difficult because you've got to look at the ground glass screen and it's upside down and back to front. So you've, you focus it by moving that same way as you would a lens. Well, the important bit here is what happens when you tilt the lens because tilting the lens moves the plane of focus. Now, this particular book, um, it's, it's quite dense. Uh, I don't have a problem with reading the, this book and the maths in it because I originally went to university to do astrophysics and although my maths is very, very rusty these days, I can get by reading something like this. You don't need particularly advanced maths to be able to follow it. There's quite a lot of it that's worth reading even if you don't follow the maths. You can skip over quite a few bits. But essentially it's written, it's quite a technical book. and. It's, I got, it got me thinking about camera movements, how to use lenses. So I got, a, for example, the older version of the Canon 24mm tilt shift. I got the 17mm as well. And this gave me the idea about how to explain the movement of the plane of focus. So that it's possible when you move a lens, when you tilt a lens, to have the plane of focus running along the floor or the ceiling or a wall or something like that all connected with some simple principles here to work out where that plane of focus is going to be. Now this, as I say, it's not written for you know the mod to be ultra readable. As a result of that I wrote quite a lot of articles 
and uh, recently I've had their videos as well, but initially it was writing articles. And after a few years, I was asked by a publisher to write a book about tilt shift lenses. And here we have my own book about tilt shift lenses, photography with tilt and shift lenses. A uh, picture of Pierre at Whitby on the front here. Now, when I wrote this, I wrote it for a very different audience. This is written for photographers because uh, I quickly realized that any equations, whether in an article or anything else, put off photographers more than many people. Um, now, yeah, there are a subset of photographers who love the maths and the optics and things like this. They can read stuff like this comfortably. This is written if you're not interested in knowing the equations. You just want to know how to use the lenses. Now, this says that as well, but in a slightly more formal manner. Now, I, this inspired me and I owe Harold Merkling a debt of gratitude for inspiring me to experiment with all these lenses and hence write the book because I remember the bit, uh, apparently uh, Stephen Hawking, when he was writing A Brief History of Time, his publishers told him that for every equation you include in a book, you halve the number of readers that go past that page. It really is that bad. Now, if you're familiar and comfortable with maths, that can seem a bit puzzling to you. But sort of, if it does seem puzzling to you, realise that you are not common factor in that. Most people really do not want to go there. We won't go into the teaching of maths and all the things that lead to that, but effectively there are some equations in this, one or two, and it, but they're confined to the appendices at the back and you could comfortably miss them out. They're mainly connected with deriving tables to um, the tilt tables I use. I have little printed tables that tell me the settings of this in most circumstances for any of these lenses. Uh, and it makes no difference if I'm using this 50 millimeter lens on the F Fuji GFX and I tilt the lens, it produces exactly the same effect as if I was using this or even if I was using it on my old Canon 100D, which is a crop sensor, so an even smaller sensor. Makes no difference the amount of tilt. Shift does look different because of the size of the sensor, hence with this. But the key to this is understanding how things change when you use shift and when you use tilt. Shift is perhaps the easy one for people to get, and it's not covered really in here. Uh, this is about tilt. So if you want to understand more about tilt, and you're one of the one or two people who complained to me that there wasn't enough maths in this book here, uh, sorry the book wasn't meant for you at all, uh, but this is great. And you can download it. As I say, I put links and things to it. So there we've got tilt and shift lenses. They, why have they made such a big difference? Well, I use it for landscape photography. I use it for all interiors. I use it in my industrial photography. And obviously I use it in my architectural photography. So yeah, all of those different things there, they are to an extent inspired by having a read of this book and actually going out and experimenting. Hence why I got this camera here to experiment with. Um, it really is, if you're used to using anything modern, something like this, yeah, it's a lot of hassle to use. I mean, now some people like using them and there are potential benefits. Um, I have to say they are vanishingly small. Every time I even remotely think of putting film in this, I find something else to do. Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the way it is these days. Um, so yeah, it is somewhat relegated to being a prop in the background of the videos. Now, I mentioned the other bit, the ins and outs of focus. You may have heard various things about to maximize your depth of field, you focus one third of the way in or something like that, or you might even have come across on phones an app which tells you uh, f the hyperfocal f settings to maximize focal coverage for a depth of focus uh, for a lens for a particular settings. Well, um, after reading this, I quickly realized that an awful lot of that was complete and utter rubbish. Um, it just doesn't work. The, the problem is that hyperfocal distance setting works for a few very specific instances. And then when you try and generalize it, it doesn't work. It also leads to things like, as I pointed out earlier, the distance scale, the focus scale on this lens here. Um, 
Now, these common features of lenses, um, whilst they are indicative and they remind you that a smaller aperture has a greater depth of field, they don't actually tell you much more than that because these all depend on critically what is meant by sharp. Now, I've done a, a video about this and I've also written an article about it. And I would say that if you are still enamored of um, using hyperfocal focusing, uh, setting distance settings, um, have a read of this, do some experiments. As ever, if you think, huh, that's nonsense, I've been using this for years. Okay, you think that. But if you want to disagree with me, go out and take some photos. That's the proof for it. I wouldn't say something like this unless it was something that, it, that led me to actually do think something differently in my own photography. So ins and outs of focus, we've got all bits and pieces there about setting focus and what's meant by sharpness. Now, remember this was written in film era. In fact, both of them were. Uh, I think they may have been updated somewhat uh, slightly, but they're still effectively about film. Film in this respect is no different to digital. It is just a different way of recording the information. The principles set out in both of these apply equally well, whether you're using film or whether you're using digital. So there you have it. Two really excellent books. Now I know most books I look at and do, I've got quite a few book reviews and things, look at pictures and they look at the subjects, they look at composition and things like that. This is down in the nitty gritty of using lenses like this. And this one is about actually taking sharp pictures, particularly when you want a particular depth of field. Um, as a result of this, most of the time for landscape, I'll just focus at infinity or focus on the subject I'm interested in. That depends on focal length and a few other things, but then that's covered in this and also say the articles, videos that I've written about it. Now, I hope that's of some interest. I say these deserve to be far more widely known. And I think it's the maths in them that has put people off. Um, that's really good. That one is what led me to do this. Um, so, yeah, as if I hadn't plugged the book enough already. If you want to know how to use lenses like this properly, how to focus them and all the tricks and things like that, do that. Now, I've actually got a new, another new tilt shift lens coming in a few days uh, and that I'm going to be doing some experiments with. I'll have some notes on that. But once again, I'm going to be looking at some, I'm going to have a reread of this um, and see if there's anything I've missed or any other little nuggets I can get out of it that might be useful to, if explained in a more general manner that didn't involve calc. Oh, uh, talking about calculations, if you have an app which works out depth of field and it tells you to focus your lens at 4.956 meters or something like that as the optimum setting, beware that spurious accuracy. Any time I see accurate numbers like, or sorry, spurious precision. Any time I see precise numbers like that, I question one, their accuracy, and two, whether they actually mean anything. Um, I don't use phone apps for anything like that because they tend to be written by computer-based people or people with an interest in computing who do a bit of photography. Um, there are some very good ones. I mean, things that will tell you where the sun is like that and tell you, you know, different things like that. There are some very useful apps, but things that do this, I'm always very wary of. Anyway, hope that was of interest and thanks very much for watching. Oh, if you've got any questions, let me know. Cheers.